Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 171 of the podcast. This is going to be an interesting episode because it kicks off a series of episodes, which is something we've never done on the podcast before. But this is all going to be related to an online event that we hosted with Ministry Boost called the Volunteer Boot Camp. And we did this uh, last summer, and it was an opportunity to have six different voices on to talk about uh, leading volunteers, whether it was recruiting or encouraging or equipping, all those aspects. And during the live online event, we took questions, which was great. But because of the limited time, we probably hit two, maybe three questions max per person. So there were a ton of questions we didn't get to. So this series of episodes is going to be an opportunity to ask the questions that didn't get to get asked, you know, in the live event to those same speakers. So I've got them all back on and we're just asking them the questions we didn't get to. So we're starting with Nina Schmidgall, who talked about recruiting volunteers. And so we, you know, hit some of the questions that came up as it relates to recruiting volunteers. And you'll find that many of them weren't necessarily about just recruiting, but some of them are about the culture that you're recruiting toward, keeping volunteers, even though in some ways that's a whole separate topic uh, on its own. So interesting questions that came in. So what we're going to do, though, is with each of these episodes, we're going to play you a small snippet from the teaching from the Volunteer Boot Camp, not the whole thing, but just a segment of it. And then we'll jump in and you'll hear us go through and, you know, I'll ask questions in this case of Nina. And so you can learn more about volunteer recruiting. And here's what you want to do. If you did not take part in volunteer boot camp, you can watch the whole thing on replay. Just go to the show notes for this episode, which is nickblevins.com slash episode 171. And there you'll find a link where you can get access to the replay of the volunteer boot camp. It comes with an outline and notes for each session. You get to watch all of the sessions. So you can listen to the snippet here. But I'd encourage you to go listen to the whole thing and really watch it because it's a video. You can watch each of the speakers present on each of those topics there. And then maybe you'll do that and even come back or maybe you'll listen to this and go watch that. Whatever the order is, you want to check out that whole thing for sure if you didn't see it when it happened live. So that's all I have for now. Let's jump in and listen to the segment of Nina talking about recruiting volunteers. And then I'll get to ask her questions that we didn't get to hit in the live event. Okay, moving on. Um, recently, so we have a number of different campuses, and recently uh, in the last year, we had a recruitment strategy, and I happened to be at a couple of our campuses and hear maybe the pitch that was given, and I was like, ah, there was a ton of like what I would consider recruitment 101 um, violations. So I just thought I would mention those here because maybe I take some of those for granted, and I'm realizing even from some of our pastoral staff that might not be as intuitive. Um, recruit to vision, not to need. Even if you're in a place of need, don't get up at front and be like, we have 30 spots to fill. And if someone does not fill these spots, our children will have no one. Um, So uh, be thinking intentionally, be giving languaging to the people that are going to be speaking on your behalf and called to vision. Um, In fact, a secondary piece of that would be tell stories. If you want to ask a number one recruitment instructor, strategy, I would say, tell the stories, celebrate the things that you want to see more of. If you want to see more of connections between adults and kids that are relationally connected outside of Sunday morning, then tell the stories where that's happening. You know, we have a volunteer who ran a 5k with one of the kids who was too afraid to do it below or or do it on their own. And so think about ways that you can tell story or share a testimony or whether you do that. And if you have a great media team and some sort of, you know, media format, if you don't, have someone up front that shares a, you know, a testimony of, of that way. But um, any way that you're going to do it, whether you're on social media, whether you're up front, whether you're in a conversation with someone, learn how to have an elevator pitch that you're calling people to a vision, not to a need. People do not want to be a part of something that is you know, desperate and, and um, you know, th- they're going to immediately ask themselves the question, why are there not more people on this team or why are there not? So you want to call to, to a vision. Um, and then I would say, of course, we know, and they're like everyone in ministry knows that the most fruitful way of recruitment is direct ask, which means clearly you're only one person 
That means you have to train your team on how to make a direct ask. Um, that means I, we call it a uh, bold friendliness. How do you have a bold friendliness where someone can say right away, Hey, have you ever considered serving on a team? I'm telling you that's something you have to train on. It is very uncomfortable until you get used to it. When you're meeting someone, how do you make a transition in a conversation? How do you train not just your leads, but all the way down to your volunteers to be intentional about drawing their friends and their community and to be, to be, have a bold friendliness and to make direct, direct asks. And then with that, I would say that means that we need to reduce the barriers to serve in our ministry. Um, now everyone had like safety is super important. Sa like all of the, the mechanisms, a lot of churches I know have, um, you know, they need to be a church member for a certain amount of time before they can serve or whatever it is. I, so I'm not going to give a prescriptive what that looks like. I'll tell you, we don't have any of that when, um, when of course, we do background checks and, and meetings and, and um, reference checks. We do all of those things. But in terms of length that you have to have attended our church or our ministry, um, I, that we just don't have the luxury of that for how quickly it turns over, how short of time people are sometimes with us in D.C. And so... Um, you know, I'll, I don't, I'll ask right away sometimes. Oh, welcome. So glad you're here. It's so great to meet you. I'm so glad you're newly attended our church. Hey, have you ever considered working with kids? So just reducing some of those barriers if you can. And some of those things are not within our own decision making. Our leadership team has, um, some, some thoughts, but, and then just a tiny little tip on that. I train my team always, if you're having a conversation with someone, always get their email. The whole like, hey, great, we'll go on our website and, um, or hey, send me an email then and we'll get you plugged in. No, no, no. Leave the ball. Do not leave the ball in their court. You don't walk away from a conversation or anyone expressing even a mild form of interest without getting their contact information. Leave the onus on you to advance the ball because people might even have the best intentions, but there's a lot of things competing for our time and our follow-up. So, um, and then working to plug people into the best spot is a way to, and I'm sure other speakers today will talk some, um, some about this, but I just wanted to make a mention of when you're having some of those conversations, those early recruitment conversations, and people say, hey, I'm going to serve wherever you have the greatest need. That, that is not a real life thing. Don't, don't accept that as an answer. Just push further. Ask more. Say, well, I have a need in a few different areas. Tell me more about you. Um, do you like working with young people? Do you like running media? Um, are you technologically gifted? Do you prefer to connect with adults? Maybe you could be on our greeting team. Like ask more questions up front. Um, and then I would just say in terms of the languaging piece, never um, be very careful with your language to not reduce the value of what you're asking people to do right off the, off the bat. Um, the way I tell my team is never say only, never use the word only when you're talking with someone, never say, oh, it's only twice a month or it's only the first service because you're immediately devaluing what they're doing before they've even stepped into the role. So try to eliminate the word only from you and your team's uh, vocabulary. When you're calling people to something great, then um, that will take a level of investment. And so speak in a way that you believe there's going to be fruit in their life and that God is going to use them. And so you don't need to use the word only because you are really believing for what God has for them. And then the final thing that I would say is um, to just spend some time as a leader evaluating and asking yourself the question, like, what is your currency? Listen, um, regardless of what you think, volunteers do not work for free. We don't pay ours money, but we certainly pay them in a lot of different ways. Um, you need to pay well. Pay in community, pay in investment and leadership, pay in, in fun, pay in celebration. Um, happy volunteers will invite their friends and they will continue serving. One of my favorite Sue Miller quotes from years and years ago, and I say this all the time and people attribute it to me, but it's from Sue Miller, is the reason that people start serving is usually different from the reason that they continue to serve. People will serve for very altruistic reasons. Hey, I heard there's a need or I just want to be, you know, my kids in this class, so I want to be faithful. But the reason someone will continue serving for a long time is um, for other reasons. You need to find out what those are and then you need to pay them well. Pay them well, in, in you, not in money, but in, in whatever their currency is. So if it's community, friendship, connection, fruit of relationship by investing in the next generation. So um, there's a few thoughts. I hope that that helps and I'm happy to answer any questions. 
All right, Nina, thanks so much for sharing with us about how to recruit volunteers. Probably like the number one thing people wanted to hear about with the volunteer boot camp. But let's hit some of the questions that we either weren't able to get in the live call or maybe you talked in the chat with people about. And now we can share them with everyone. And there are two up front that I want to ask you that are kind of related. One person asked, when asking volunteers to commit, what time do you ask for? Like once a month, twice a month, weekly. And then somebody else said, how have you consistently encourage people to serve more? Like, so if they do serve monthly or every other week, or that's what they're wanting, how do you encourage them to take something like weekly, you know, that's more frequent? So what do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, consistency of service is, it's one of the like most important tenets to a discipleship model for sure, because we know that we know that faith is transferred through relationship. We know that. And so it is one of the things that I think is really important to, to fight for. And it is one of the hardest things because people have so many, you know, competing, there are real life challenges. And we even know people are attending church less often. And so, you know, a regular attender will maybe be, yeah, I attend here regularly when I'm in town. That's maybe once or twice a month. And so asking them to serve kind of beyond that is hard. And I'll just say historically at at our church, when we, and I think most of us in leadership now probably look back and realize this as a tr- strategic error. When we launched locations, we were launching in the marketplace and launching really quickly. So we launched all of them with one service. So right off the bat, that meant we had to have a rotating schedule. And the way we did it was first and third, second and fourth. And then the fifth Sunday of the month, we actually um, would always do something called Sunday Fun Day, which is when we asked all volunteers to be on deck and they, they did really fun. It was kind of a moment for connection with just leaders. We suspended some of the Bible content and just played together. And so that is actually still what we do at our at our locations that have just one service, um, some of our, our marketplace locations. I will just tell you in my role, that is one of the biggest um, hurdles to um, depth of discipleship that we face as a ministry. And so I do not like it. Um, and so at, at our location, I just, I guess I would say in any way possible to, um, to fight for, for kids to see this, at least with their small group leaders, see the same faces every week. And some ways that we, uh, do that are, and, and this is actually an experiment this year. I, and it, some ways it's worked well and others it hasn't is people that serve weekly. So they, you know, serve one service, attend the next service, and they're that consistent face every week. If they have to be gone, like they're going to be traveling and all of that, we actually take responsibility to help them find their sub. And so they'll mark it on the schedule. I'm out. And so we'll start kind of working to, you know, fill someone in people that serve, uh, every other week. And we actually don't take any volunteer into our ministry at less than twice a month, just because we believe in that importance of relationship and that's across all roles. But, uh, when they, if the ones that are serving, uh, just a couple of times a month, if they need to find a sub, we ask that they do it, that they make a swap with someone or that they reach out to the sub list or something like that. So, so that's not really a recruiting answer. Um, that's just giving you a little bit of how we, uh, approach it, but, uh, celebrating the stories of longevity um, that's, that's one way that you kind of recruit to that. And then one tip I always say is when people are signing up and they're kind of uncertain, or if you're really wanting to push people to a bigger commitment, a lot of times, um, we'll just ask them, Hey, would you be willing to give it a try? And, you know, would you do this for as we actually moved campuses this, this summer. And so we knew it was going to be a big switch. And so I asked a lot of people, would you be willing to serve in this weekly basis, just commit to do it for the next three months. Um, we're at a, pl- a time where we need we need an additional level of commitment. And you would be amazed at how many of them at the end of that, when they realize, because what we know is that the greatest amount of fruit for the volunteer is, um, you know, don't say someone's no for them, first of all. And we know in your heart, don't feel apologetic when you're asking people to rise up to something a little bit more, because we know that some of the greatest fruit, the real relationship and the fruit of discipleship and connection really comes with consistency. That's good. Yeah. And I think, I mean, just being able to say, like you said, most of the roles are weekly in the campuses that can have that. Um, the biggest challenge I feel like is, some, is with people who already serve and they've already done once a month or twice a month. Like they already know they can do that. Uh, new people, they only know what you tell them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you want to start shifting, we did that a long time ago where you start shifting to weekly uh, that's just what you offer them. And you just have to be okay when they walk away. Like I never forget the time we had the mom walk at like, ah, I really want to do it, but I can't do weekly. I mean, she was, her kids had been our elementary ministry. She knew the value of it. 
And she she left, like, you know, left the conversation basically saying, yeah, I, I can't do that. And then walked back in, you know, like five minutes later, like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm oh, gonna do it okay. You know? So I, yeah. I know one guy one time that had, he actually had this phrase and he had it written on the back of all of their t-shirts. And I've, I keep saying, I'm going to do this. It said consistency plus longevity equals impact. And he had it put oh. across the back of all of their t-shirts and they just started talking about it all the time. And That's so awesome. I've started trying to use that language, even with new volunteers. Oh man, I know it's a lot had to ask, but you know, consistency plus longevity is really what equals impact. And when you start saying that stuff, people will believe you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And it uh, is true anyway. Another, uh, speaking of phrases, I don't exactly use this there, but like with coaches and stuff, I'll tell people, you got to say this, it's not for everyone because it's not oh, for everyone. Good. And then people that are like me would be like, oh, it's Ooh. for me though. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it it's not for everyone, people. but I'm not just everyone. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> You kind of acknowledge, you know, and then maybe get them to feel inspired to be like, ah, it's not, it's not, but maybe it's for me. So one of the things you talked about was like paying your volunteers, not cash, (laughs) not, not money, but uh, just like how it kind of, how you pay them back with things that aren't money. And somebody else asked, can you give, give examples of that? And then someone else asked, what is one thing you've done to increase the value of, you know, of, of serving and a culture of that. So, and I feel like those two are related. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, just to, to recap, just the idea that, that volunteers, no one like works for free. Right. And, and, you know, I mentioned that Sue Miller quote that the reason people start serving is usually different than why they keep serving. And so you need to ask the question of not just what, how you're going to convince them to serve, but what are the ways you're going to keep them serving? And so just asking yourself the question, what is your currency? What is the value that people take away from work serving in the ministry? And how can you increase that? that value. And I think that looks, um, different in a lot of different ways. I mean, I think for some people it's like, it's, it's access to the pastor, the pastoral staff. And so for example, on some of the weeks, like we have, we've been doing communion through this whole series that we're doing, which we don't always do. Well, if our volunteers, um, you know, are serving, they might miss that moment. And so I ask our pastoral staff, will you come in early and just have kind of an individual private moment with the team? So they don't miss out on that, that, you know, that piece. I mean, things like relationship and community, those are the things that that, that's the currency that people like to be um, paid in. Um, They like to hear that they're having an impact. So sharing with them the stories that you hear back from parents or that kids share, um, highlighting those in different ways through the church, things like fun. I mean, just silliness a little bit. I mean, celebrating things that we're really big on swag. Our t-shirt system is part of our security system, but it's also a way of saying that you belong to something. And then we celebrate them all year long with, we just did visors at one of our training events and everyone got kind of visors with their logo on them. We have coffee mugs. So if someone's walking around with a coffee mug, they, you know, they know that they're a part of this team. And so just asking the question is, is um, what's the currency? What are the ways that you are are paying people that you're expressing value, that you're helping them make connections and friends and, People are noticing if they're there or not there on a Sunday. Um, and I can't answer that for you and your church, but I think if you spent a little bit of time asking a couple of questions or just even reflecting, um, you would really get some some great ideas about how you can uh, you can just increase the value and, and the payback for some of the people that are giving of their time and, and making sacrifices to invest alongside of you. All right. Well, something else you mentioned is bold friendliness needs to be trained. And somebody asked, can you suggest how that happens in your world? Yeah. You know, <laughs> how to train it is that it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's, it's, um, that, that stuff really is modeled. The idea that you would, um, you know, begin a conversation with someone at the coffee table in the lobby of church and then be willing at some point to say like, Hey, you know, have you ever considered working with our our family ministry or with our kids program or anything or something along the lines, that's a very uncomfortable ask for someone unless they can, you know, maybe see it modeled. And so I think giving people ideas of what that looks like, I mean, honestly, the, the swag stuff helps with that a little bit. It's a, those things can be natural conversation starters, uh, but just encouraging people to, to learn how to ask great questions when they're meeting someone new at the church or getting, or they're in their small groups to just to, um, you know, to be willing to, to be, to be bold in their ask. So we know that the majority of people that serve in, in a ministry 
or in a role are there because someone asked them directly. We, we know statistically that that is the number one reason that people serve. It's not from a pulp and announcement. It's usually from direct ask. So how do you train your teams or just encourage your teams, I guess I would say, to um, be to be askers, to be inviters and have an inviting culture and mentality. And, and frankly, I mean, this is going well beyond the scope of this conversation, but that's something that all of us should grow in because um, frankly, we should have that sort of culture just in sharing of our faith, period. How are we looking to, to, um, to share the joy and the excitement about what we have in our lives and to invite others into it? So, Yeah, true. Absolutely. We um, just last week at our soccer our, our son's soccer game, one of the moms that we hadn't really met, she uh, afterwards was like inviting everybody to kind of like a fall fest, trunk or treat, whatever it was at her church. And I was just thinking, she and she we don't know each other. We just met that day, actually. So she didn't know, you know, that I work for a church and all that. And I just thought, how bold, how awesome was that of her to do that? Because that's not easy, you know, in that yeah. moment. And, and I don't she, think it's my natural it. tendency, honestly. And um, I have to kind of be more comfortable with it. And and some of that goes hand in hand with building a strong culture. I mean, people are excited to talk about and invite others into things that are healthy and fun. And so if your teams aren't healthy and people are stressed out and they're serving more than they want or they're unprepared like that, they're not going to be great inviters. Uh, so yeah. so part of the work on that is just building something um, that's fun and exciting that people want to be a part of. Yep. All right. Any, this is an interesting question to ask you because I know your context, but any specific strategies for recruiting in an aging church? You know, so the person said that almost all their ministries and outreach efforts are next gen specific, which is great. But uh, a lot of the people that are part of the church are older. They'll give financially, but they said that that doesn't mean they want to volunteer on Sunday. Um, So what would you say to that? How do you recruit folks in a church where they want to fund it? They believe in it, but they're older and they're not serving though. They're not stepping up to serve in volunteer roles. That, that yes, that is comical in my, in my setting for sure, because we don't have a ton of those. In fact, um, I try to use my invite culture, the strongest on, on gray haired friends, I guess I would say. Um, because actually while they sometimes, at least, I mean, the problem that we have is the majority of our churches and, you know, twenties and thirties and young professionals is they are, the demands on their time are so heavy. And so, um, you know, I think that that, that is just a different sort of challenge, but I think that, so I don't have a ton of um, expertise there though. I will tell you that the few of our, you know, more aged volunteers have often been our best, our very best, um, because they just, they bring a certain nurturing quality and, and, um, but there is an additional challenge there. And so I would just probably what comes to mind is to be reflecting on what some of the barriers might be and maybe even asking some of those, um, you know, more, I don't know, more experienced aged um, candidates, what some of the barriers are. So for example, a lot of our locations are in marketplace spaces and we do rugs and carpets on the ground to get down on the ground. If you're, if you're, older to be sitting on the ground or getting up and down a lot. It's just like super uncomfortable. And so I, there's just like, there's no interest, like that would be a barrier right there. So what are some ways that you would work around that? We also operate almost entirely on technology and we send our lessons via email and all that. That's very overwhelming and stressful for them to figure out how they're going to access their lessons. I'm thinking of one Um, older volunteer that we had in particular. And I used to, we used to print her lessons for her and hand them to her at the beginning of the month. And so maybe just starting by asking some of the questions about, Hey, what are some of the barriers? And then um, drawing out some specific, I actually run into the challenge where I would like, I love it when dads or men in general serve in our ministry, they play differently. Our boys love it. Actually, everyone loves it. And so um, I just make a specific ask. I say like our kids need some more incredible, um, men in their life. And I have seen a few things in you that are so incredible or your name keeps coming up. A lot of times I'll ask my volunteers if they will recommend someone else that I can ask and not, I I say, instead of you going to them, will you send me their email? And I will say, Hey, I have heard your name as someone who would be incredible in this ministry. Would you ever consider it? So try to think of some pieces, you know, some different angles like that. So I don't know if that helps. That's not really my context, but that's a few things that come to mind. Well, as you said, you were talking about asking some of them, like what are their thoughts and what are their barriers too? I wonder, uh, that takes me back to like the church I grew up in. Who, who are the influential ones? Where like if you could talk about that and they were on board with the idea, 
of yeah. not just them serving, but like older generations serving and being a part of it, uh, who could they then influence? Right. Cause you, you might not have the influence, you know, so that could work too. Right. If, if that true. exists. That's All true. right. How about this one? Again, this isn't, this isn't your context. You're like quite the opposite, but somebody said our security team requires that someone is a member for six months before they can serve with kids. And I was telling you that this is also, I've seen this a lot with church insurance companies now. So sometimes it's not even about membership as much as, uh, they just have to be there, you know, for six months. Yeah. Uh, and then what they're saying is by the time somebody's been there six months, they usually hear they're involved in a different ministry. So how do I find volunteers for children's ministry when it seems like everyone is eligible to be plugged in elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, that's not my context either. We Because living in Washington, D.C., people, so many people that come here and that are part of our church are here for either an education opportunity or a fellowship or, or a, a job situation that, you know, is... A lot of times we have people here for a year, two years, um, and and so waiting six months for. In fact, we have quite a bit of internship programs and things too. Um, we that would be very difficult for us, and uh, so I can understand some of the challenges for sure. And and how you get around? Oh, they're serving kind of somewhere else at that point, or you know, I don't necessarily know. But I'll just tell you that that I mean, at the heart of the question is the questions about the assimilation process and how do we. Um, help people kind of join and get on board to our team at, at the soonest possible possible date. And, and um, that is, that is certainly something that we try to do. I mean, from the time that I meet someone, it can be their first or second Sunday. Now, granted, if they're not, you know, a more integrated part of our community, then we, we do a little bit more work on the front end. We have a pretty robust, um, uh, not only background check situation, we probably pay more than most churches to run them because we need to check so many different states and, and things. But we also, um, we have a pretty robust reference check we situation where we work really hard to work our way through a list of references, which is a lot of work and time considering the number of volunteers we process. Um, but that is because we are not requiring someone to have been a part of our community for, for a long time on the front end. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think guess the question: How do you how do you get them if they're already serving somewhere else? I don't know how to necessarily answer that, but um, but on our end, we do work really hard to try to 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 get folks plugged in as quickly as possible, and and partly because we believe ministry brings fruit. We believe that when um, individuals are serving, that that's when they're connected to community and making friends. That's when they are uh, receiving the the fruit of investment with young people and with families. And we believe that that is an important part of the church experience. So uh, that's why we try to get them plugged in. In fact, we say when anyone comes to the church, our goals are that they would get plugged into a small group, that they would um, start serving in a ministry, and that they would go on mission, uh, either locally in our city or somewhere around the world. That's our goal for everyone that walks in the front door of the church. And so we move right away um, to towards those goals. Yeah. Yeah, I was telling you that our uh, we've had those same kind of conversations with our insurance company because they wanted to have the six month thing, and I think some of it is, um, it makes a little bit more sense if your church is smaller and like imagine if you're like a church of two hundred and if somebody's there for six months, you might even know them for six months. Uh, if your church is larger, you may not know the person has been there three months any less or more than the person has been there two years. You know, if they haven't made themselves sure. known. You know, yeah. I should say that we did actually add a couple of years ago, I'm remembering now, we added that one of your references, when you submit references, one of them does have to be, um, at, you know, another ncc or another church attender. I don't think, I'm trying to remember, I don't think we specify how long they have to have attended, but basically we're saying, hey, we need someone who is a part of this community to vouch for you. And yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. there are some people, if it's their first or second weekend, that like, they might not have that yet. And so- um, you know, we're asking that at some point they put forward a reference that is a part of our community in some capacity, but, um, yeah. 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 The other thing that I think, again, it depends on why see this person phrased it, that their security team is requiring that. And it, it could be an insurance thing. It could be just their own policy or whatever. But the other thing too, is from the perspective of an insurance company or that kind of safety, what they care, what they're caring about is people who are in rooms with kids you know what I mean? And yeah. there's even other ways you can serve in kids ministry or student ministry that isn't directly with kids that wouldn't sure. require the six month thing. And so you can get creative there and serve, you know, a few months on a welcome team or administratively during the week or, you know, something like that, uh, guest services. And then, 
transition to a role that might be a small group leader or something like that once six months has passed. So you can get creative to try to not lose them to these other ministries like they're talking about here. Yeah, that's it. That actually is a great, <coughs> a great point. A really creative ask. And then just again, like continue to build the community and the incredible things going on in your ministry and, and to tell those stories well, because even if they did get plugged into another ministry, if they have a heart that's really drawn towards those things, they're going to find their way to you at some point yeah. if you continue to do those things well. All right. Last question. And I'm going to kind of give two, I'm going to make it about two different angles, even though the person that wrote it did not make it about two different angles, but that way it helps okay. uh, different groups of people. Their main question is how do you help provide community? This is one of the main reasons people don't want to serve in kids. Now their reason they say is because they feel disconnected from their adult small groups, which tells me that they have some type of Sunday school or small groups that competes with kids ministry. Like it happens at the same time. But I think the community thing matters, even if that's not true. Like even if you don't have something competing, um, it's good. It's important to create community among your volunteers, but it is hard. Think I, and I have a theory that like the younger the kids are, the harder the community is for volunteers, you know, cause you're more yeah. focused on the kids and there's less free time versus like we were just talking about our student ministries fall retreat. If you serve in student ministry, uh, those volunteers have great community cause they have lots of time together. They do retreats. Yeah. There's, they're not eyes on a baby all the time. You know what I mean? Like, so anyway, how do you help provide community among volunteers? Yes. Um, well, I mean, we have one additional challenge, like I told you, which is just, you know, turnover. We have probably, um, and in fact, some of our locations that are further outside of the city, they have the strongest community because there's the greatest longevity there, you know. Um, so that is an additional challenge for us. But, um, uh, you know, lately, this is kind of a new thing. I've been, like, m interested in the idea of, um, I've been much more intentional about focus groups. You probably hear me a lot in this conversation, even saying, ask people, ask people what the barriers are, ask people what's going on there. I think like your volunteers, particularly your already committed volunteers, um, ask them, maybe, maybe provide lunch one day or have, um, or even just do a, like a Google call with five or six people. If it's hard to get people together or, and say, Hey, can we, would you be willing to join? And I'll even provide lunch and spend just an hour helping me talk about what are some incredible ways that we could increase community and connection on our team. And you'll be amazed because I can give you my ideas, but they work for our community. And, and, and in your community, the challenges will be different. For example, if you have a lot of volunteers that have really um, small kids, uh, that's the case for us at a lot of our locations that, that people have a lot of young kids. So serving is just challenging. So, you know, we started something we call it extended. It's basically a program where the kids, they can go to kids church once, but then they stay and just get to play. And that way volunteers can serve and, and then go into service and, um, and, and not miss out on some of those components. And so if some of it, they feel like, no, I'm missing out on some other pieces to be a part of this community, then you have to lower some of those barriers. Um, you know, is it, you know, some sort of connection or lunch together? Is it something, you know, what are the things that they that your community actually needs? I don't, I don't know that I can answer that for you, but I think pulling your team together and, and asking some things really is um, a way that you'll get the best answers on that. So some of the ways that we do it is we just, we celebrate big, we make appreciation a really big part of what, what we do. Um, we try to, it's not easy at all of our locations, but we try to work margin into the morning. So people have some time to just connect and talk. Um, even the way that they're doing prep in the morning in terms of prepping, if they have to do any cutting or any prepping, we really encourage them to sit kind of together around their little table with their same consistent volunteers. And so that, and, and ask some intentional questions and getting to know one another. And so and then things like you have to model serving. So when someone in our community is is moving and needs help with something like that, when you can rally some of the other leaders that serve alongside of them and say, hey, we're going to show up for this person. And we like to think of our ministry ministry groups at the same level that we think of um, our small groups in terms of their role in community. Who are the people that are going to show up for you? If someone is, is ill or facing a surgery, could you, you know get a leader to rally those people and maybe make a meal or deliver those things. And so, and, and listen, I'll just tell you, I am not, I personally am not good at this. I'm very intentional in friendship, but just I'm, I tend more towards task and work and, and being remaining committed relationally and, and making sure that that at the end of the day, I feel satisfied if the job got done well, whereas a mm -hmm. lot of people, they will feel satisfied if they felt connected to children and yeah. to one another 
So I have always rallied people around me on our team that are, that are great at this. And so that would be one of my big suggestions. Have someone on your team, have a volunteer that this is actually their job is to help, you know, build community. Um, maybe that means, you know, bringing in something fun one Sunday morning, just as a, as a snack or surprise or, you know, so it all falls. I mean, that's, uh, those are under appreciation categories, community categories, but being involved in, in one another's lives, if that's not your normal tendency go to, then, then, you know, recruit some people that think like that. And then that's always on their mind. So it's, mm-hmm. it's important. It's not my natural tendency to go there and, and, um, and so I really have to bring the people alongside of me that do it well. And I have to ask really good questions of, of the people on our teams about what sort of community, what would build community and connection and relationship for them. Yeah. All right. Well, that, that's it. That's all the questions. Go ahead. Just one last idea. One thing I've been thinking about a lot lately, and, and I don't know the size of people's churches that are listening and, um, but Lately, we've been, as more people are joining our teams, I'm trying to figure out, I need a way to like identify the people that have been on the team for, you know, not just their first week, but maybe their first month or first six weeks. And so we're trying to figure out a way to do that, whether it's a different color name tag or something like that. Um, Because I realize those are the people who are most in need of those connections on the front end. So that's just one little tip that we've been working on is how do we make sure that those people who are in their first few weeks of serving stand out so that we can be drawing them in, in a new way and helping them, you know, connect and make connections in a new way. Yeah. That's a great idea. Cause if they get over that hurdle, then they'll feel, you know, and then they make some connections and, and relationships and all that. They'll feel completely connected at that point and then yeah. more, much more likely to stick. That's good. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks uh, for doing the volunteer boot camp, talking about, recruiting, which is probably the one thing people want to hear about most and for coming back and answering some of these questions. We didn't get to hit live on the call. We appreciate it. Yeah. Happy to. All right. Lots of great content there with Nina. Again, if you didn't listen to or watch the volunteer boot camp live, check out that replay. You can get all that uh, in the show notes at nickblevins.com slash episode 171. A few of the action items I think of coming out of that interview, but also from what Nina taught uh, during boot camp was one to maybe increase the commitment of your volunteers. If your volunteers serve once every other week or once every four weeks, increasing that frequency of, you know, of serving can be the easiest way to grow your team. Another simple action step would be to meet with potential volunteers. Again, you don't know if they're going to serve. You have no idea, but meeting with them, you can uh, have that opportunity to figure out if serving might be a fit, or maybe you're going to, you know, just be a pastor to them and figure out what their best next step might be. But meet with some potential volunteers, maybe ones that you don't even know that you're going to contact kind of, you know, cold out of the blue through your church management system or something like that. And then lastly, if you want to hear more about how to do that kind of recruitment, something that you can work on every week and it's a full system and all of that and and more than that, actually, uh, you might want to check out my volunteer playbook course with Ministry Boost. The Probably the biggest reason you would want to do it is because of the volunteer recruiting aspect, but the course actually is about establishing a healthy volunteer culture and system. So it talks about coach structures and training and communication and vision and all that stuff too, Uh, though I think most people probably take it because they want to recruit more volunteers, and certainly it could help you with that. So those are a few things I think of coming out of that uh, interview with Nina. And again, make sure you check out the full teaching of the volunteer boot camp. And while you're there, you'll probably want to watch some of the other sessions in future weeks. We'll have the other folks on who taught and we'll ask them the questions that we didn't get to in the live event. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of those episodes. And uh, yeah, that's all we have for this episode. Hope you have a great week and we'll catch you next time on the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.